Hello everyone, welcome to today's teaching session on the biomechanical analysis of the lateral cervical spine x-rays with me Mark Spriggs. So before we get really started into the nitty gritty you should have all have downloaded these worksheets including the example cases for you to work through. These will be part of your formative ass assessment um, and feedback so please work through them both during and after the teaching session. You can handwrite the sheets or if you want to fill them out um, digitally uh, feel free. Worksheet 1 is question and answers and worksheets uh, 2 are example cases for you to use the uh, methods we're going to be discussing and analysing today um, for you to write down the measurements and any comments at the bottom. The learning outcomes and objectives for today's teaching session are uh, by the end of this session you should be able to demonstrate how to biomechanically assess the lateral cervical spine x-ray. You should be able to discuss what the normal spine, uh, normal lateral cervical spine should look like for that individual patient. How to compare, contrast and distinguish it from abnormal. Judge the different menstruation methods for biomechanical analysis discussed in this session and explain why some measurement techniques are more appropriate than others. So before we get started uh, into the real nuts and bolts of today's teaching session I want you to take a moment and fill out part of uh, the worksheet one using using this um, and I'd like you to just for a, take a few moments to really reflect and think about what the lateral cervical spine should look like on an x-ray. What are your preconceived perception and ideas of what uh, its overall shape should be? Tell me what the architecture of the C1 T2, T2 segment should look like. The segmental alignment should be. What the soft tissues look like. And any methods and tools that you currently use to assess the cervical spine. Use worksheet one to write down your initial thoughts on the lateral cervical spine x-rays for discussion with your peers and also for your formative assessment. If you wish to pause the video so you can do this, please do this now. So hopefully the normal cervical spine uh, that you have pictured in your mind's eye should look very similar to this diagram where we have a lovely uh, normal linear C-shaped curvature to the cervical spine in its lovely lordotic position. We're looking for a smooth geometric shape of the lordosis, lovely smooth borders to the end, of the end plates of the vertebrae. The green line represents George's line or the path of the posterior longitudinal ligament and we should want to see lovely, lovely healthy disc spaces as well. There should be no breaks or distortions within George's line or within the path of the posterior longitudinal ligament along that green line as well. So when we talk about the normal cervical spine there are a few uh, bits and pieces that we need to make clear from the off. One is that its normal configuration is lordotic in normal subjects and there's a few studies there for you to read in your own time regarding this this uh, this section. Cervical kyphosis is a pathological state of the cervical spine with its own ICD code which is the International Code for Disease put out by the World Health Organization. Changes away from its configuration from lordotic are associated with the patient's symptoms and there's a study done by McAveeny et al in 2005 that's also part of your extra reading on this. Any breaks and disruptions in George's line of the posterior body margins i.e. sagittal translation displacement distances forwards or backwards of each individual vertebrae on top of another of greater than 3.5 millimeters is classed as un, uh, unstable or abnormal and a segmental relative rotation angle of greater than 11 to 12 degrees is also abnormal. So the main areas of discussion for today are the methods we'll be talking about are going to be the four line cob angle method and the posterior tangent method and we're going to be discussing and comparing these two uh, methods of assessment 
and the thoracic inlet morphology with the T1 slope. These are um, this is another uh, area of discussion um, that is part and parcel of your uh, extra reading as well. By the end of the session, it'll become obvious why we're doing it the way that we're doing it today. So, as you should be aware, this is the four-line Cobb angle method. A line is drawn through the midpoint of the anterior arch of C1. Uh, this is achieved by bisecting the anterior arch of C1 all the way through the midline to the posterior arch of C1. And then a 90 degree perpendicular line is drawn inferiorly from here. The inferior line is drawn along the inferior end plate of the T1 vertebrae. And then a 90 degree perpendicular line is drawn uh, superiorly from there. Where the two perpendicular lines intersect is obviously where we get the Cobb angle from. Whilst this this line has been shown, or this method has been shown to be re repeatable and reliable, there are a few flaws that we're going to be talking about and, and discussing in today's session. For example, as you can see from this particular example on the screen, when we bisect C1 and we also use the end plate of T1, we get quite a large angle of lordosis that's generated and indicated by the red arrow just there. One of the big flaws with it is uh, very simple. All you need to do is use two different points of where you draw your lines and you get a completely different angle. So uh, here's the same image as the previous example with the lines drawn from the end plate of C2 and the inferior end plate of C7. And you notice that there's a significant, a significantly different angle which is formed at the intersection of the two perpendicular lines. So this calls into question the validity of the four-line Cobb angle, especially when it's used for lordotic uh, measurements. And you can see again, if I put the two sides aside, here's the two examples. You take exactly the same X-ray, draw the lines at two completely different sections, and you get two completely different angles. So which one's right? Which one's good? Which one's not? You could also argue as well that the great thing about using C1 is that you do end up, you obviously end up with a lovely straight line. This is assuming that the morphology of C1 allows that to occur because the end plate of C2 has usually got this curved margin to it. So when, when you draw the line through the end plate of C2, you're obviously drawing, you're trying to draw through a curved surface. So that's not, it's not ideal. And also when you look at the C1, T1 example, the end plate of T1, when it's in this particular image, is not the easiest to make out. So again, if we can't see T1, obviously we can't get a C1 to T1 measurement. So then you, you have to move it to C2 uh, and C7. So again, there's many, many different ways of having to draw this angle and you get two completely different values obtained by using the same method on the same x-ray. Here's a practical example for you. Here's, here's an x-ray of a patient who presented to our clinic uh, with chronic neck pain and headaches. These are obviously the same x-ray duplicated and uh, all we've done is we've taken the measurements from uh, the bisection of C1 and the inferior end plate of T1 and we get a dangle of 53.4 degrees of lordosis when using the C1 to T1 method. However, if we just simply move it down, move that the, the superior line down to the end plate of C2, the intersection of those two lines, we get an angle of 12.7 degrees. So in a, a nearly 41 degree discrepancy of lordosis is seen in the same patient on the same image. So again, this calls into question the validity of, of the four line Cobb angle when applied to the, the uh, cervical spine lordosis. Other disadvantages of using the four-line Cobb angle are that it takes cross-sections through the curve, which isn't a true demonstration of the actual slope of the curve. We're going to talk about that in a few moments as well. Um, it's got an inaccurate, um, a high standard area of measurement and a high standard deviation as well. It only provides a total angle of, angle of curve and not the segmental angles, which is also important when it comes to biomechanical analysis of the spine. There's a huge variation depending on which, obviously, inferior and superior end plates or which segments you decide to take the measurement from, even using the same x-ray. And uh, the end plate morphology 
of the vertebrae can also vary as well. And as we said, the C1, uh, sorry, C2 has uh, the end plate of C2 tends to have a very curved uh, uh, surface to it. So, are you really taking an accurate measurement using that method? The advantages, however, of using this uh, the four line Cobb angle method is that uh, it has it does have a high um, a uh, high intra examiner repeatability and reliability so whilst you can question the validity of it um, the same um, measure or the same examiner doing using this method will get repeatable and reliable outcomes using it so it is repeatable and reliable especially in the intra examiner reliability uh, measurements and uh, most x-ray software um, analysis uh, methods have it has as a standardized feature so in terms of ease of access it's also very easy for people to be able to use the four line Cobb angle method. Next we're going to move on to the Harrison posterior tangent method. Uh, the green lines represent the posterior body line, lines or margins of each vertebra in the cervical spine. This method looks complex and it can be intimidating when first viewed without explanation. This method utilizes complex mathematics, which is why many clinicians are obviously intimidated by it. But you don't have to be a math genius to understand how this method works, and soon you may be considering using it in the future. Uh, in mathematics and engineering, um, when you are looking to measure the slope of a curve, you wouldn't use a four-line Cobb angle method. You would use what are called tangent lines. So using the diagram that's just popped up in the bottom left, if you have a curved slope and you wanted to figure out the angle of that curve, you would draw a line that travels along an aspect or a area of that slope, but it doesn't cross it. It, don't, it won't cross that line. And then you can either take another tangent along here and that will, and you can measure the angle or you use some slightly complicated mathematics to be able to use uh, trigonometry to uh, draw a triangle, and that will end. Up, you can end up working out the angle of um, the angle of the slope or the slope of the curve using a tangent line. So that's how you would do it in engineering and mathematics. When you apply that to the cervical spine, the great thing about the cervical spine is obviously because it's made up of segments that usually have a straight posterior margin. You just simply draw along the posterior margins. You could draw the line as long as you like. Where the two lines intersect at the end plate or the uh, posterior body margin of, this, of the segment above, you simply get a lovely tangent angle right there. So you can just, m and then you measure them all out and um, you can obviously analyze the spine using this method. When you use the posterior tangent method, you, you'll obviously, as we just said, you'll end up with two main angles. One, in, in, demonstrated in A, is the ARA, or the absolute rotation angle, which is the total angle of curvature. You achieve this by drawing a tangent line along the posterior body margin of C7. And you do the same again at C2, where the two lines intersect. That gives you the total angle of curvature, or the absolute rotation angle. What you can also then do is, as illustrated in B, you can do that between each segment, and they are called RRAs or relative rotation angles. You just simply again draw a tangent line along the posterior body margin of the two segments and then the, where the two lines intersect that gives you your relative rotation angle. The great thing about it as well is the sum of the relative rotation angles spread out over all seven vertebrae will give you will give rise to the total angle of curve. So the ARA and the RRAs should all add up to be equal to one another as well. Just a quick note with how to express the mathematics of the posterior tangent method. When you're looking at a spine or segments that are in a lordotic configuration, we use a negative sign in front of the value in order to express that they are in extension or it is going in a lordotic configuration. When you're assessing two segments or a total, seg or a total angle of curve and you end up with a, a kyphotic or a flexed position, then you simply use a positive value. And that indicates or is a simple way of expressing whether or not it's going in the right direction, whether it's in a lordotic configuration or whether it's in a flexed kyphotic position. 
So let's try and put this into a practical example. So using this method just here, obviously using the posterior tangent method, we've drawn all of our tangent lines along each vertebrae and we end up with the lordosis being an extension. If we then have this patient who came in with again chronic neck pain and migraines in this particular case, you can see how he's got a kyphotic configuration to his cervical spine. And again, the posterior tangent method will allow you to accurately measure the kyphotic angulation, whereas using this example, if we use the, the four-line cob angle method, we may find that we don't actually still end up with a kyphosis, because if we draw it from, bi from the bisection of C1 and the end plate of T1, we may actually find that that still doesn't give us a kyphotic configuration. So in this position, obviously, they are this, this, this example on the right-hand side is a kyphosis, where, whereby we've got a mid-cervical flexion occurring. Image on the left has a lordosis, which is negative 40 degrees, indicating that it's going into extension. And the other one has a positive 35 degrees, so it is a complete reversal of the entire curvature of the cervical spine. Segmental instability. When using the posterior tangent method, it's easy to figure out uh, and measure segmental stability or instability because you're using the method to find the relative rotation angles or the intersegmental angles. Okay. A uh, segmental instability is defined as an anterior or posterior translation uh, displacement or a retro or a spondylolisthesis of greater than 3.5 millimeters in the cervical spine or a displacement distance of the vertebrae above that has moved greater than 20% of the superior end plate's width of the vertebra below. It's quite a complicated method to use. A relative rotation angle or the intersegmental angles of greater than 11 to 12 degrees as discussed at the beginning. Segmental flexion or kyphosis is also seen as a sign of, in of instability or ligamentous damage. So here we have an example of a, case of a patient who came into our clinic with chronic neck pain, headaches, and also he had hypertension. Notice, first of all, the absolute rotation angle of this patient written above at the top part of the screen measures negative 18.8 degrees. Ignore the other values just here. Let's just focus on the ARA for the moment. When we then look at the intersegmental ARA, uh, sorry, re uh, the, the, the um, relative rotation angles of each segment of the spine, which are indicated by the red posterior tangent lines. Between C6 and C7, we have a negative 3.3 degrees, meaning that these two are in a lordotic configuration, they are in extension. However, between C5 and C6, we have a positive 3.7 degrees, indicating that these two are in, in fact in flexion, and you can see that on the image if you, if you look closely. Then between C3 and C4, we have a, a relative rotation angle of three point, negative 3.1 degrees. And then if you look at C3, C4, we have a massive negative 15.7 degrees, indicating that C3, C4 is going to be unstable. Okay. What this also shows as well is that of the negative 18.8 degrees, 15, you know, nearly 16 degrees of that 18.8 degrees occurs between the C3, C4 segments. So it's an enormous amount of excess motion that's occurred just there. And what we can also see as well is if we use the posterior tangent method to also try and demonstrate the path of the posterior longitudinal ligament, you can see that there's a break in George's line so there is a posterior displacement of C3 on top of C4, and this actually measured 3.7 uh, millimeters. So these two together indicate that C3 is actually unstable on top of C4. So we've got ligamentous damage leading to segmental instability, and we found it using the posterior tangent method. If we go back to the previous example as well, where we've got the the, uh, the, the, the two methods of using the four-line Cobb angle, where we had a 53.4 degrees of lordosis on one view and a 12.7 degrees on the other one using, using the different methods. What we can also see 
if we use the posterior tangent method, the red line that's traveling up the posterior, uh, the posterior tangent line of T1, when we measure the displacement distance just here between C7 and T1, we ended up with an ARA of 18.7 degrees total, and the majority of this occurred as in greater than greater than 12 degrees happens right here between T1 and, uh, and C7. So indicating again that we've got some possible segmental instability occurring. If we use the four line Cobb angle method, we've missed this. And so the patient may not have the best outcomes when applying certain types of treatment to the area. The advantages of using the posterior tangent method uh, include uh, it's, it's got a high repeatab repeatable and reliable um, status with regards to uh, interclass coefficients and um, scientific scrutiny, so it is repeatable and reliable. Different that's that's also that's intra and inter um, examiner reliability as well. So not only can if 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 I did the same measurements on the same X-rays, I'd end up with the same numbers or, re or very close very close to each other, but so will somebody else as well. So it's got a high inter and intra examiner reliability and repeatability. It's able to easily demonstrate segmental angles of rotation or the a or the RRAs as well as the total angle of curve whereas one only uses the, the Cobb angle only you only get one and because it uses the first derivative of a curved column uh, or a curved slope it is more mathematically sound to use this method rather than the Cobb angle which obviously uses cross sections through the curve rather than tangents along it. The disadvantages of using uh, the posterior tangent method are that there are not many x-ray analysis software programs that have it as a standard method, which means that um, you, as the examiner of the x-ray, need to perform this usually by hand, uh, which takes time and is complicated, and obviously therefore there is an increased risk of error when doing it by hand as opposed to doing it um, using a computer software program. It obviously seems complicated and many, uh, many practitioners are scared off by using it. And it's also not currently taught in many university programs either. So it's not something that's readily available or seen very often as well um, in, the, um, uh, in the university settings. The last uh, angle we're going to talk about, or the last method we're going to talk about, is the thoracic inlet morphology. This is a very, um, this is seen again as a very complicated method, but we'll talk about it because it allows you to accurately predict what the patient's cervical lordosis should be. So the thoracic inlet morphology is made up of three angles, being the T1 slope, the inlet angle, and the neck tilt angle. The T1 slope uh, is measured from the superior end plate of T1 compared to horizontal. I'll pop that in there, there we go. So you draw a, ta you, you draw a, uh, a line along the superior end plate of T1 and you compare it to horizontal, which is the blue line. The thoracic inlet angle, uh, this is drawn uh, in two different ways. The more common way uh, as is depicted here, is you bisect the T1 vertebral body and draw a line through it inferiorly, and that is at a perpendicular angle, a 90 degree angle, from the superior end plate line that we've drawn. The superior end plate line just here, and then you bisect it through the middle at 90 degrees, that is your starting point. You then draw Another line, which is the neck, oh sorry, so this is the, this, so the, this angle just here where the end plate and the bisection line inferiorly, this is, um, this is part and parcel of what's going to be the thoracic inlet morphology angle as well. The neck tilt angle is a superior line that's drawn from the manubrium or the uh, sternal notch. Uh, straight vertically and if we're able to if you extend the T1 um, superior end plate um, 
uh, line all the way down to the to the notch uh, to the um, maneuver room or the external notch you'll end up with a nice angle that's that's developed just here. So this is the neck tilt angle, this is the T1 slope, and then this is the thoracic inlet angle. Okay. So reason why this is important is the thoracic inlet morphology, as I said before, is a nice prediction value for what the cervical lordosis should be in each individual patient. As you can see from the diagram, this is taken from Lee et al's paper in 2012. The smaller the thoracic inlet angle the smaller the T1 slope will be, and these predict or give rise to the cervical lordosis. So the larger the thoracic inlet angle, as seen on the right-hand side, the larger T1 slope, the larger thoracic inlet angle, the greater the lordosis should be. The smaller the T1 slope, the smaller the thoracic inlet angle, the, s the smaller the magnitude of cervical lordosis should be. So this is very important when it's each individual patient comes to you, you can obviously use these methods along with the posterior tangent method to find out whether or not there's a mismatch. So for example, if the patient has a large T1 slope and a large thoracic inlet morphology and yet they still have a shallow uh, or a very uh, a shallow uh, cervical lordosis or a very straight cervical lordosis, there's a mismatch just here. So it may indicate that there's actually pathology that's going on within the patient's cervical spine because the two biomechanical analysis methods aren't matching up to each other. So for your uh, assignment, I want you to work through the worksheets that are shown at the, at the front. Worksheet one involves student comments uh, that will start with the, the normal at the start and then a reflection upon what you've learnt during this teaching session. I want you to collect your comments for discussion with your peers, to form formative feedback with your tutor. For example, I want you to try and read into these methods to try and formulate arguments for, for and against the use and of these approaches, what you've learnt and your, what your preconceptions were prior to this teaching session. This teaching session was designed to challenge what you currently understand and what you currently know or think you know about cervical spine analysis and, and the cervical spine in its integrity. and. So I want you to be able to write down for me what you th what you thought beforehand, what was challenged, and now what you think afterwards. The next bit after you've completed worksheet one is to work through the case examples. I want you to use the sagittal x-ray outline drawings that you have, and I want you to use both the four-line Cobb angle and the posterior tangent methods on all four um, um, all four worksheets to demonstrate an application of these methods discussed. On the worksheets there are spaces for you to be able to write down the Cobb angle that you found and the posterior tangent methods um, like the, the ARAs and the RRAs that you find on each one. And I want you to w use worksheets to uh, to discuss how these different methods may impact patient treatment and recommendations for for interventions now that you know how to use them and also obviously what depending on what values you find using the other readings that are in your reference list at the end. I want you to email your answers to me uh, for formative and summative feedback um, discussion with myself within 14 days. Uh, so I'll get back to you within 14 days, that means. So send them over to me as soon as you can and within 14 days of receiving them I will assess them, mark them and we'll, I'll give you feedback. Uh, and prepare your answers for bo of both worksheets for discussion in a forum with myself and your peers on a Zoom conference call in 21 days after this lecture is complete. Okay. Final part is your references, where um, a lot of these you'll find on PubMed, and uh, it would be a good idea for you to read through as many as you can. A couple of them are books. The top one, Harrison et al., Structural Rehabilitation of the Cervical Spine, is a textbook, and the Punjabi and White textbook, uh, where is it? Um, oh no, I've given you the given the article just there. So um, the problem of clinical instability of the human spine, um, in, in uh, that's that's in uh, clinical biomechanics of the spine. So if you can get hold of those two, fantastic. If not, work through the others, and you'll be able to use these as your references for your discussion. Thank you very much, and enjoy.